Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jenny Stupera, and I'm the heart failure coordinator at St. Elizabeth Hospital. Um, we'll be um, going over some advanced heart failure information here in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, on the table, you picked up a little card that says um, thank you on it, and there's a link attached to it. So when this um, presentation is done, if you could um, fill out a survey after the um, with that link, and then you, once that survey is filled out, then you'll be able to get your CEU for this time. So I wanted to let you know about that. So a few things we'll um, cover today. We're going to look at um, what exactly is heart failure. We'll look at some causes. Um, review the classifications of how um, you can um, organize these patients. Uh, we'll look at systolic versus diastolic. We'll look at a, a bunch of different treatment options for them. Um, signs and symptoms of some things to watch out for, medications, and then we'll also look at some important education that you can provide your patients. So this is kind of an interesting um, slide in that it shows um, how many patients are being diagnosed with heart failure annually. Um, in about 2010, there were almost 6 million patients that had heart failure, um, and you can see that it's growing pretty exponentially. Um, they add about 670,000 new cases a year. So a lot of heart failure, you're gonna be seeing it a lot more in your facilities. Um, we're seeing it a lot more in the hospital. Um, so buckle up, they're coming in. So, <laughs> And there, it's also one of the most expensive um, diagnoses as well. These patients are frequently readmitted. Um, they spend a lot of time in, with, uh, in skilled nursing facilities with home health. They need a lot of extra support because of their chronic condition. Um, so it is a very costly um, diagnosis. Um, and about, and as you probably know, in 2012, uh, Medicare um, is no longer going to reimburse the hospital for patients that are readmitted within 30 days. So their initial readmission and then if they're admitted within 30 days with anything, um, the they don't pay for that second admission. So um, the hospitals are, are really looking into that, um, trying to reduce readmissions, and that's a, a huge part of uh, help from you guys. So we'll just do just some basic anatomy, um, how the heart, the normal heart works. Um, so the oxygen-rich blood comes from the lungs into the left atrium, and then it's pumped out to the rest of the body. And then uh, the oxygen-depleted blood goes into the right atrium, right ventricle, and then into the lungs. So what exactly is heart failure? It's a chronic condition. Um, it's something that cannot be cured unless you have a heart transplant. Um, it's a progressive condition, so it's going to eventually get worse. Um, try to treat it along the way with symptoms, but it will eventually get, get worse. Um, but it's the inability of the heart to pump the, enough blood out, um, and we'll go into <coughs> more detail about that in a little bit. And a lot of times it affects, it affects both sides of the heart, but it's usually the left side first that it affects. So of that 5.7 million Americans that currently have heart failure, about 10% have advanced heart failure. And that's what we treat in our um, heart failure clinic out at Nebraska Heart. Uh, Dr. Gina Menzer is our cardiologist, um, and she's uh, board certified in heart failure. Um, so she um, spends a lot of time in education treating these patients. We do a lot of advanced therapies with them. Um, we have a surgeon, Dr. Sauger Donnelly, who implants our uh, left ventricular assist devices, the LVADs, and we'll talk about those in a little bit as well. Um, and we have a pretty big team um, for these advanced heart failure patients. Um, with these classes of heart failure, the New York Heart Association um, has come up with four different classes. <coughs> it's not something that you have to memorize, but just know that class one is the least severe, class four is the, is the most severe. So if you see that documented somewhere on patient record, class three or class four, you know that they're pretty severe heart failure. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Um, the class three patients are the ones that you will probably see most typically come to a facility, um, and they come to the hospital pretty frequently. Um, they are starting to get symptoms with just very minimal exertion. Um, so walking from the kitchen to the bathroom or the kitchen to the living room, they're starting to get short of breath from that. Um, the class four patients are the ones that are short of breath just sitting at rest. Um, those are the ones that we're gonna do the very advanced therapies with um, in our heart failure clinic. 
there's also some different stages, and it's the same as the classes. So A is the least severe, and, and D is the, is the most severe. Um, so you'll see uh, that listed in the chart. You'll see class, or you'll see three C or three D. Um, so then you can kind of see how severe their symptoms truly are. Um, the stage A is basically they are at risk for heart failure, so they may have obesity, diabetes, uh, hypertension, those kinds of risk factors. Uh, once they get to B, they may have some kind of structural heart disease, they may have some kind of valve leakage, uh, mitral valve regurge, aortic stenosis, something like that uh, that could lead to more severe symptoms. Um, and then it goes down uh, the road to stage C where you are, you for sure have some kind of structural defect, maybe they had an MI, some kind of ischemic episode, um, or the, the valves are not working correctly. And then the D is when you're really requiring um, like IV inotropes, um, the advanced, the very advanced therapies. Um, so the left ventricle is typically the side that will fail first, and there's a couple of different things that we'll talk about. Um, ischemic coronary artery disease is, a, is one of the big ones, so they have an MI, non-STEMI, something like that. Hypertension is a big one. Um, if their hypertension is uncontrolled, that's a big one that can cause that left ventricle to um, have some dysfunction. And then dilated cardiomyopathies as well. And there's, there's a lot of different kinds of cardiomyopathy, but we'll just talk about three different ones today. Um, the dilated, the, the heart um, chambers are enlarged, and I'll show you a picture here in just a second. Um, hypertrophic, the muscle wall is very thick, and I also have a picture of that. And then restrictive, that is the, um, I would say the worst. Um, it, it's the one we can't treat very well. By the time that the wall muscle is restrictive, it's just not beating very well. It's very rigid. And there's not a lot of medications or anything we can give them to make that wall muscle work better once it gets to that point. Um, so restrictive is, is very challenging to treat if a patient has that. So here's the dilated, and you can see how big and boggy that left ventricle gets. It gets so stretched out, and it's just not going to pump like it should because it's so stretched out. And the same with the hypertrophic, you can see how thick the septum is and how thick the wall muscle is. Um, the area inside of here is a lot smaller than over there, so the amount of blood in here is a lot less that can be pumped out. So that's um, another problem that we encounter. Lots and lots of causes of heart failure. So patients will ask, well, how did this happen? Well, there's a lot of things that could have caused it. Um, the valvular heart disease, like we talked about a minute ago, the mitral regurge, tricuspid regurge, if they have aortic stenosis, anything like that. If we can fix the valve, and a lot of times we can fix the heart failure, then their heart function will improve. Um, in infection and virus, we see that a lot. Um, we go through all the testing, we do heart caths, we check them all out, and we don't have a good reason as to why they're in heart failure. Um, so we try to see if maybe they were sick a couple of months ago. Did you have a fever? Were you, you know, did you have some kind of bronchitis? You know, there's different viruses that can cause a heart failure, um, and a lot of times they will reverse themselves um, if it's a viral cause. Alcohol and drug abuse, we see that a lot, um, especially in the ICU, um, patients that come in um, with alcohol withdrawal, um, a lot of times will have a lower EF, and if they stop the agent, then a lot of times it can reverse itself. Tachyarrhythmia, so AFib with RDR, that's a very common one, we see that a lot in the hospital. If they're in AFib, um, if we can cardiovert them, then a lot of times it will, it will reverse itself as well. Um, chemo, radiation, another big cause of, of heart failure. And then sometimes um, it's idiopathic. We don't really have a cause. Stress can be, can be a cause. Um, if you've heard of that taco subo syndrome, um, where the heart kind of looks like a tea kettle, it stretches out, and it's all stress-related. And it's a lot of times in women, um, if they had a major event happen, their husband passed away, you know, something like that, a stressful event, um, it can cause their heart to stretch out um, and they can have heart failure. Um, a lot of times if we can help them through that event, um, it will reverse itself. So this kind of illustrates um, the different stages and the different treatments that we might use. Um, by the time they get to that stage D, that's when you're up using the IV inotropes, the dobutamine, the milrinol, those kinds of things, um, bad transplant, and then eventually hospice. 
So the difference between systolic versus diastolic heart failure, it's important to know the difference because we do different treatments for different things, um, different medications. Um, so the normal heart will pump with each contraction, will pump about 60% of the amount of blood in that left ventricle will be pumped out with each beat. So that's the ejection fraction, the amount of blood that's pumped out with each beat. So when you get into the systolic dysfunction, only um, it can be less, it's less than 40% of that amount of blood is pumped out with each beat. So if their EF is only 15%, only 15% of the amount of blood in that ventricle is being pumped out to the rest of the body. So you can see how they would become hypoxic, they're not thinking clearly, their kidneys don't work well, because they're not getting perfusion to any of their organs because the ejection fraction is so low. Now with diastolic, the amount of blood in here that's pumped out is normal, 60%, or, um, but I should say the amount in here is actually less than what is in a normal heart. So this is that hypertrophic heart where they have that really thick muscle. So this is, the amount in here is a lot less, but the amount that is pumped out is 60%, if that makes sense. So they're getting 60% of the amount that's in here, but the amount is less to start off with. The diastolics are harder to treat because of that thick wall muscle. Um, there's not as many treatment options for them. So systolic, their EFs can be 35 or less. Um, that's the kind of the hallmark sign. You'll see that on the echo. Um, it can be regional or it can be global um, if they had an MI. And several different causes, coronary artery disease, hypertension. And this is the most common type of heart failure. And then you'll see it on the, on the echo. EF 15%, you know right away that that's a systolic heart failure. And diastolic, it doesn't fill properly, so it can't pump as, um, as much blood, doesn't get pumped out as much. It doesn't rest. The problem is with the diastolic, the muscle doesn't rest as much as it should. So for diastole, so that there's not as much blood that fills in the, in the ventricle for diastole. So it's not resting, and there's not a lot of medications we can give them to make the heart rest more. We can give more medications to make it pump, but not to make it rest as much. So that's why it's harder to treat the diastolic heart failures. There's different stages of diastolic as well. So it's the same principle. Grade one is the least severe, grade four is the most severe. And these are the restrictive heart failure. Um, the muscle's very rigid, very stiff. That's why it's not relaxing and letting the blood fill into the ventricle. So when you get to that really restrictive phase, um, that's when we have to really look at LVAD transplant, that kind of thing. And then you'll see that on the, on the um, echo report, grade one diastolic, grade two diastolic, so you know how severe, how restrictive that muscle is. Acute versus chronic, there's a lot of different causes of how they would become into an acute phase. Um, Noncompliance, it's more, it's, it's not as much as noncompliance as a lack of understanding. That's kind of the main thing. They're on so many medications and we're constantly titrating the medications and moving the medications around, switching them up on medications. So a lot of times when, you know, it's an 85 year old, they're confused about what they're supposed to be taking and they take the wrong dose. They take too much, not enough, and then they get into an exacerbation problem because of that. Um, diet is also a huge issue. Um, our American diets with the high salt, um, it's very hard to eat and limit that salt. Um, you have to be very conscious of what you're eating and really look at the food labels um, to see what you're doing. So it's difficult, it's very difficult. Um, so we try to help them and coach them along as much as we can. Uh, the AFib with RVR, as we talked about before, if they go into that, a lot of times they'll go into an exacerbation. If they have an MI, we see that a lot, um, go into an exacerbation as well. And then some of the things we talked about earlier, infections, alcohol, those kinds of things. Lots of things we do to diagnose. Um, we check their history of physical, we get a chest x-ray. A lot of times heart failure and pneumonia, COPD kind of mimic each other with the shortness of breath, so we get a chest x-ray to make sure it's not pneumonia. Um, we'll get an echo. Uh, we'll check a BNP if it's elevated over 200, um, then we know that they're in some kind of an exacerbation. Um, and then we get a heart cath 
a lot of times if it's a new diagnosis of heart failure, we'll get a heart cath to see if they have a blockage, something we can stent. If it's a valve issue, something we can fix right away. So here's a chest x-ray, um, and you can see the cardiomegaly, how big that heart muscle is on that chest x-ray. And then here's a couple pictures of um, heart cath. There's a wire that goes up through, they feed the, um, the catheter through, um, put stents in, they can do all kinds of stuff with, with heart cath sound. And then there's another image there as well. Left and right sided heart failure. Um, when I think of this, I think of left lungs is how I think of it. So that's the patient that has left heart failure. They're going to have the coughing. They're going to have the dyspnea. They're going to have the wheezes. It's all lung related. It's all backing up um, to the lungs. Right sided, that's when they're going to get the JVD. They're going to get the enlarged liver, the abdominal distension. Um, nausea, peripheral edema, that's all the right sided. And a lot of times it's a combo of both. So they'll have all the edema and the shortness of breath. Um, so we'll have to treat, treat for both. Um, one thing to ask your patients is mid afternoon, if they just are not hungry, their appetite is going down, um, about mid afternoon, that's when all the fluid builds up in their abdomen. So if they have a lot of fluid in there, they're not going to be hungry. So if that's something that's kind of new for your patients, they're all of a sudden not hungry. It could all be fluid building up in their belly. Um, so something to kind of watch out for and kind of monitor for to see if that could be um, why they're not hungry. Maybe we need diuresia. Lots of medications that we give these patients. Um, we start with the diuretics. So the first <coughs> thing we're going to try is a loop diuretic, uh, Lasix. Uh, Lasix is kind of unpredictable in how it is absorbed. So um, one time you'll take it and 80% of it will be absorbed. Another time you'll take it and only 20% of it will be absorbed. So it doesn't work the same every time you take it. So if you have your patient on Lasix and they're not diuresing very well, Dr. Munzer will quite often switch them to torsamide. It's twice as potent as Lasix um, and it works the same every time you take it. It is more expensive, so that's why we typically start with the Lasix first. Um, but it works great, the torsomite does. Then if they're still needing additional diuretics, we'll, we'll do the potassium sparing. So we'll add the aldactone on top of it. And the benefit of the aldactone too is that it's potassium sparing. So if your patients are having trouble um, swallowing those giant horse pills of potassium, we can put them on the aldactone and then they can take less potassium. So we do that a lot as well. And then if they're still needing additional diuretics, then we'll add the metolazone. And that one works, it is very powerful. Um, you really have to watch the creatinine, really have to watch the potassium with that one. Um, it has to be prescribed by somebody that really knows what they're doing. So uh, uh, the renal docs use it and Dr. Menser uses it. Um, so they really have to watch it. But it work. I mean, your patients are gonna be diuresing like crazy if, when they have them on metolazone. Uh, with the IV Lasix, just make sure you're not getting it too fast to cause the ototoxicity. And then make sure you're watching your potassium levels and your creatinine levels as well with those drugs. The potassium sparing, um, obviously you have to watch for too high of potassium and hyperkalemia. But another interesting side effect is the gynecomastia. And I worked with Dr. Mentor this last summer. We had um, a couple of men actually that came in and they started developing chest wall soreness, muscle soreness, um, and they were developing the gynecomastia from the aldactone. So we stopped the drug, put it on their allergy list, um, and a lot of times it's not reversible, which is unfortunate. So um, that's something to kind of watch out for if your patients are kind of exhibiting those, those symptoms. And then the xeroxalin really watched for the for the metolazone. Um, it helps your body um, with salt, so you can your salt level can be your sodium level can drop with that one as well. Now, if they're if they're in systolic heart failure and their EF is less than 40, we want to put them on either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Um, those are the ACEs are all the pril drugs, like sinapril, benazapril, and allopril. So we want to make sure if their EF is less than 40, we have them on an ACE. Now, if their kidney function is bad, they can't be on an ACE. So we have to make sure that that's documented in the record 
EFs less than 40, but they can't be on an ACE because they're in stage 3 kidney disease, something like that. Um, one of the side effects to really watch out for with the ACEs are the dry hacking cough. Um, if they develop that, we have to stop the drug and put, them, put that on their allergy list. Um, and then we would switch them to an ARB, and that's COZAR is the, is the most um, popular drug of that. That's the only generic form of this drug, so they are more expensive, and that's why we start them with the ACEs first. Um, but there's a lot less chance of cough with, with the ACE, or with the ARB. Um, in your packet as well, I handed out another PowerPoint um, that I'll just show you, that I'll just talk to you about. Uh, there's a new drug that just hit the market um, this last fall, it's called Impresto. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention in case you see it, because uh, the FDA just approved it. Um, the drug trial was so successful that they stopped the drug trial early and um, the FDA approved it right away. Um, it was so successful in reducing symptoms, reducing hospitalizations, um, that it's now on the market. It's being used. Um, Dr. Menzer is prescribing it. Um, we've had good luck with um, the, the uh, insurance companies covering the drug. I mean, it's about $4,800 a year, so it's pretty expensive. But so far, we've had um, good luck. So we have to do prior ops for it, but um, we've had good luck with it being approved. So I wanted to let you know in case you came across it, one of your patients may, may be on that drug. Um, and it'll probably, you'll probably be seeing it a lot more frequently. Um, it's been talked about a lot at national conferences. A lot of cardiologists are going to start, just going to start using it. Beta blockers also very important for the heart failure patients. And with the beta blockers, one thing to really um, keep in mind is um, it does lower the blood pressure, it does lower the heart rate, but the main point of the Coray or the, um, the Toprol that we put them on is to really help that contractility <coughs> of the muscle. So if their blood pressure is dropping and their heart rate is dropping, make sure you call the cardiologist and find out what hold parameters they want for that drug um, because the patient really needs this medication to help their heart function. So make sure you just call and get hold parameters. Do you want the, are you okay with their blood pressure 92? Um, systolic, um, maybe, they, maybe they're okay. A lot of times they're okay with it being in the 90s. So just make sure you call and find out if you're considering holding the medication because it is so important. Um, and a lot of times when we start them on these medications, it, because it lowers the blood pressure and heart rate, it just makes the patient feel kind of bleh when they first start it. So if they aren't tolerating it very well, we can switch them to a different type. So if we start them on Coreg, we can switch it to Toprol XL, and a lot of times that will work. We'll, we'll play around with it to see what works best, but they really need to be on a beta blocker of some sort. And these are just the most um, common uh, beta blockers we put them on. Hydralazine we use occasionally if they can't use an ACE or an ARB, um, it, it works um, for that purpose as well. Nitrates, if they're having some kind of angina, we'll put them on some Imper or Isobil. Um, it helps to relax that smooth muscle. So we use that occasionally. Um, the inotropes, um, do you guys take care of inotrope patients with dopamine? Mm -hmm. um, uh, no or no, over here, great, mm -hmm. great. So we, we do a lot of patients in the hospital and then we have a lot of outpatients as well, patients that go home on it. Um, and this is, the dobutamine really helps to increase the contractility of the heart. Um, a good thing about the dobutamine is if they're starting to have any of the side effects, it's half-life is only two minutes. So you shut it off and it's out of their system right away. So a good thing about, that's a, a really positive thing about the dobutamine. Um, dopamine we use in the hospital for blood pressure issues. Um, it can cause tachycardia and nausea. Those are the two main side effects with that, so we really have to watch for that. Also a really low half-life, so if you're having any problems, shut it off and it's out of their system. Now we do use milrinone on occasion. Um, it's just like uh, dobutamine, um, but it's half like as much longer, two and a half hours. So if they're having problems, it takes longer to get out of their system. Um, but it also causes vasodilatation and the increased contractility. So some of our patients that don't talk, do well on the dobutamine, we'll put them on milrinone and they'll do really well with that. Much, much more expensive than dobutamine. Um, significantly more expensive for the outpatient patient. So um, we really work with insurance companies on that. Ditch is a weak inotrope. We use it on occasion. Just make sure you're watching for that ditch toxicity if any of your patients are on that, that halo around the lights. 
would try all of that, diuretics, and they're still fluid overloaded, 30, 40 pounds fluid overloaded. So we can do what's called ultrafiltration or aquaphoresis. Um, and it's, uh, you use a large bore IV with it, a central line, and it basically pulls out all of the fluid. Um, it's kind of like dialysis. Um, they don't have to have a dialysis cap, it's just like a central line. But we do do this at the heart hospital. Um, and we've pulled, you know, 34 pounds off of patients with this. Um, and you do it over um, about a 48 hour period to pull the fluid off. You're really watching the electrolytes during that time. Um, but we can really get a lot of fluid off with these patients. Now, um, you may have had uh, met two of our LVAD coordinators, um, Rachel Smith um, and Kelly Stutzman. Um, they're on my team as well, and they um, they uh, manage the patients that have had the um, HeartMate 2 implanted, which is the type of de LVAD device that we use. Um, so it's surgically implanted. Uh, it's a continuous flow. So one thing to really watch out for with these patients, once they get this device implanted, their risk of bleeding is probably the number one thing to really watch out for. Um, because it's a continuous flow, now all of a sudden their um, gut that hasn't been perfused forever is now getting blood flow. Um, and so a lot of times you get a GI bleed, very, very common. So watch out for that. Nose bleeds also is very, very common. Um, we have a lot of patients that are admitted with nose bleeds that are just uncontrollable. Um, so we have to keep their INR between two and three or on the higher side um, because of this device. So really watching for bleeding, that's, that's number one with the side effects of this. Another thing too um, that they may have talked to you about is that these patients don't have a pulse or blood pressure. Um, so we get, um, we use a Doppler and we get their uh, mean arterial pressure, their MAP, um, to see how they're doing um, with that. So you won't find a pulse, so don't be alarmed if you have these patients. Um, they, just, they just won't have one because it's a continuous flow. It's not a beat like, like a heart. Um, we do these for bridge to transplant, and we also do these for destination therapy. Um, there was a patient actually um, this last week, uh, he's one of our bad patients, and um, I can tell the story because it was on the news. Um, he lives out um, in Elba, Nebraska, central Nebraska, was on the transplant list for about a year. He was our first LVAD patient that we implanted. Um, so he's been on the transplant list since we implanted him. Um, he got the call on um, February 2nd. It was actually February 3rd, like at 2 a.m. And you all know what happened February 2nd. We had that massive blizzard. So he's at home, 18 inches of snow, can't get out of his driveway. So they call um, dispatch. His wife calls dispatch. Um, they get a hold of all of these people from around his community. They plowed his whole um, county road up to his driveway. They plowed him out to the interstate. <coughs> the um, state patrol met him at the interstate because the interstate was closed. They opened the gate for him. They plowed him clear to Omaha, got him to the hospital. Oh, nice. And uh, he had his family last Wednesday. <laughs> so they, we got a picture of him um, up walking in the hallway He after his transplant last Wednesday. So he's doing fabulous. So, so who pays for that? <laughs> the, the snow plow. And all that stuff, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, don't, I don't know. Well, hopefully they were nice and just wrote right. it off. They ate it, yeah. <laughs> so, but it, was, it was amazing. I thought it was an amazing story. So, uh, when they call, when you have a heart, you have to get there. Yeah. You know, this is it. So. Can I switch tapes just real quick?